photographers. This is the Canon EOS RP, and its best feature is its low price. In 2019, this is the lowest price full frame camera on the market. Now that requires a few compromises, but clearly not in quality. There's no compromise on the LCD, a touch sensitive TFT display with a 1 million dot resolution and a fully articulated front swiveling screen. Can't vlog without it. No skimping on audio ports, mic in and headphone out are included. Now inside is a full frame 26 megapixel sensor and Canon's latest processor. I'm usually complaining about the kit lens, but not here. While it does bump up the price significantly, this lens delivers the quality the sensor needs to do its best. You'll see the photos, but more on the lens later. Now the centered over the lens OLED electronic viewfinder has a bright and clear 2.3 million dot resolution, and that should satisfy those coming from an optical viewfinder. Now the RP has a fairly classic DSLR style, a good number of controls on the top and bottom. And ergonomically, it feels slightly small for my hand, but the deep grip and the angled thumb rest make it easy to hold. The forward tilted shutter release is index finger friendly. My thumb slips easily to the back dial, index over to the top dial. AF on perfectly positioned for back focus, nice. And now that my hand is comfortable, how do I turn it on? For easy access, usability seems to dictate that it should be on the right close to the shutter, but I found it over on the left on this lovely but overachieving dial. It seems designed for better things like selecting ISO or EV or drive modes. Another unintuitive left side placement is the menu key. Now on a DSLR, the left side is perfect. On a mirrorless camera with the menu available in the viewfinder, a right side placement is preferred. The 12 position exposure mode dial is on the right side in addition to the standard exposure modes, auto, scene, and video, there's FV, which seems to be the replacement for program, aperture, shutter, and manual, as it does them all. Now, I suppose that Canon thought it would confuse us, but after trying it out, there's no need to use any of the others. FV is easier and more flexible. Across the bottom of the screen, all three exposure settings and exposure compensation are in auto mode. Use the back dial to choose the setting to adjust, then turn the top dial to select your setting. For portraits with a defocused background, select aperture and set a value like f4, or select a smaller aperture for landscapes. Select a fast shutter speed to freeze motion, or a slow one to blur. And this would be manual mode, but the auto ISO keeps the exposure set according to your meter selection. Adjust the exposure compensation as needed or the ISO, but selecting the ISO removes EV as a setting. One request I'd make is that when EV is not available, that display indicates the meter reading as it does in manual exposure mode. In the absence of a meter, the histogram is available as a display option. Press info until it appears. The settings menu offers either brightness or RGB histogram displays, as well as two sizes, but no ability to position it. I've been adjusting all of these settings with the dials, which is what I do with the viewfinder, but if you're an LCD shooter, touch also works. Slide the graph to select the setting. Any setting with a rounded corner outline can be adjusted using touch. One thing, whether you're using tap and snap or the shutter to take a photo, it seems to take longer than usual before the review image appears and then the live scene returns. But FV mode is a feature that truly improves exposure setting. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away. Back to the rest of the dials. Now also on top is a video record key, a multi-function key, I'll get back to that, and a lock switch. On the thumb rest, the asterisk is configurable to lock focus and or exposure, and a multi-function focus key. Then a multi-function controller, the center key opens the Q menu, info changes the display, play, and delete keys. There's a hot shoe, but no included flash. On the left side, mini, not the too small micro HDMI port, USB-C type connector, and a remote port. All of this is in a small and light 485 gram package. 
battery and SD card doors on the bottom with enough space from the center tripod mount that it doesn't get in the way, UHS-2 is supported. With images of two cards and a sealed off slot, it looks like at some point Canon considered a micro SD slot here. The R-mount L-series RF 24-105 adds 700 grams, but it's totally worth it. Filter diameter is 77 millimeters, closest focus is 45 centimeters. Aperture is a constant f4 to f22, adjusted using a dedicated unmarked but detented ring, which works only in aperture priority mode. A focus by wire using a dedicated and unmarked ring. The menu custom function 3 selects whether rotation speed changes the travel distance or remains fixed. When it is linked to the rotation speed, there's no correlation between the ring and the distance, and this makes it difficult to make a predictable focus change. Using the linked setting, the focus ring can be marked, and returning to the mark returns to a specific focus distance. For video, this capability is useful for doing a rack focus. Of course, there is an easier way to do this with touch. However, I find the operation slightly slower than I'd like. I thought that increasing the auto switching speed might help, or increasing the tracking sensitivity would change the speed, but it doesn't seem to. Marked manual zoom ring, one quarter turn tight to wide. The lens extends about five centimeters fully zoomed. Switches on the lens select auto or manual focus and enable or disable the stabilizer. A lock freezes the lens at 24 millimeters. Now I love my L series EF 24 to 105, but this may be a nicer lens. Let's get a few settings set before we start. Image quality settings include 14-bit and compressed RAW, and several JPEG options. The aspect ratio selection includes a 1.6 APS-C crop and square, in addition to 4x3, 16x9, and full, or 3x2. The default image review setting is 2 seconds. Exposure simulation to see the effects of aperture, shutter, and ISO adjustments in the viewfinder and on the LCD is also on by default. Touch, which simplifies a lot of tasks, is on by default with sensitive and disable functions, and the LCD can be used as a touchpad while shooting with the viewfinder. The menu has options to enable this feature, to set the area used, and to select relative or absolute selection method. I'm preferring absolute, as it requires less paddling. Autofocus has two operation modes, single and servo, or continuous. This setting is also found on the Q overlay menu, but not in video mode, where continuous is the default and only focus method settings are available. Use the menu to disable continuous autofocus in video. One shot turns green when focus is achieved, which it does nice and fast, even in low light situations. With servo, the confirmation color is blue. <laughs> I appreciate this subtle but useful cue. With single point, press the AF control key and use the cursor control dial to select the point. Movement is much more granular than the size of the selection point, which can be positioned to the very top and bottom of the screen and nearly all the way to the left and right edges. The delete key recenters. Touch can also be used to reposition when shooting with the LCD. Press info for a 5 time and 10 time expanded view. Use the multifunction key to change to spot AF, which is a smaller selection area with the same coverage. Again, even at the very edges of the screen, focus is fast and reliable. Use the two expand AF modes to select a larger area, or zone an even larger area, and these can all be moved. Now, I'm sure you're noticing the on-screen feedback and cues about the options and controls. I'm appreciating those. Face and eye detect are combined with tracking. The current status icon is displayed top left. Now it's the face. Press the shutter or AF on and Anne is quickly detected. Then press info to switch to eye. Yes, it's confusing. It says disable, but it should say disabled and now enabled with a D the icon changes to an eye, and eyes are detected quickly. Panning to Anne grabs the eye with good speed. Rotating Anne also works quickly. The tracking mode does not have a way to select an object, so I was surprised that it picked up the Brio train in the distance. Usually the engine has to be closer, and it follows it nicely around the track. 
Shooting with burst resulted in very few misses. Use the switch on the lens to select manual focus. On this lens, the middle ring adjusts focus. There's an on-screen distance indicator. Press the focus area key to select a focus point, press info to zoom in to expanded views of 5 and 10 times, but without the assistance of the indicator. Touch also selects zoom and can move the expanded area. Focus bracket is enabled on the menu. Up to 1000 minus one shots, 10 steps, and exposure setting option. As always, trial and error is required to determine the number of shots and focus steps. And there's no in-camera focus stack option, but that's easily done in Photoshop. White balance is set from the quick menu. There are two versions of auto, not sure why they can't both be on the slider. And there are color shift options, 19 steps in both directions, or dial in a three-step bracket along both. With this selected, a single shutter press saves three images. This capability is also available for all the presets with all the usual suspects. White balance without the options is also selectable from the multifunction menu. Kelvin settings can be selected from 2500 to 10,000 in 100 step increments, and the custom setting can capture as low as 2000. Capturing a custom white balance is more complicated than usual. Save an image of a white or gray card under the lighting conditions you want, and in the menu, select the custom white balance option and find the photo. Confirm and then select. Color profiles or picture styles in the Canon language start with a series of presets covering standard and specific situations like portrait, landscape, and black and white. For fine tuning, six parameters can be adjusted for each. And will help us illustrate the difference between portrait, standard, neutral, and faithful. And there are three custom slots to create and store your personal preferences, and there's a great deal of control and capability here, with three settings for sharpening, as well as contrast and saturation. And the monochrome mode has a selection of color filters to change the response, and several filters to add a color hue, like sepia. The RP has neither filters, like toy, nor effects, like miniature. Honestly, I don't miss them. There's a multi-exposure mode with two to nine exposures and addition or average blending. Nine images is neat, but even with five, the transparency is high. Using multi-exposure doesn't disable the feature when you're done with the first image. And here's a capability I haven't seen elsewhere. Multi-exposure can also start with an image you've already taken, which provides a little more creativity and flexibility if you really want to do this in camera. Another missing feature, panorama. In my excitement about the FV setting, I skipped over some other exposure settings. Turn the mode dial to green for the fully auto scene detecting mode. This mode has lots of on-screen help tips. The detected scene appears upper left. Touch the Creative Assist in the bottom right for color filter presets and English language controls to adjust the background blur, brightness, contrast, saturation, and color shift controls. On the left, use touch to select the drive mode for burst or timers, image quality, including RAW, and the touch shutter control for tap and snap. The Q button also opens the creative controls. The M Fun key opens drive setting. The scene mode position selects and sets the options required for situations like sports, where continuous autofocus and burst are automatically selected. A four exposure handheld night setting, and an HDR backlight control, as well as a silent mode for sleeping children, if your children do that kind of thing. Even experienced photographers will find these scenes a handy shortcut to enable several settings at once. In scene mode, the Q button has additional features, and fun is still limited to drive. Switch to Program and use the Q menu to choose a meter setting, evaluative, partial, spot, and center weighted average. Now in Program mode, there's no shift mode for alternate shutter and aperture combinations. Exposure compensation offers three stops up and down. And now both the Q menu and the multifunction menu are fully functional. 
Shutter priority, time value in the Canon language, use the top dial to set values from 1 over 4000 to 30 seconds. The mode dial has a B setting for bulb mode. Use the menu to set a bulb timer, which appears to allow settings up to 99 hours, an unusually long amount. Aperture priority also uses the top dial. In manual, the top dial is shutter, the rear dial aperture, but of course, there's a menu setting to switch those. Oh, nearly forgot. There's a detented ring on the lens, which can set aperture or other settings, including ISO and exposure compensation. For stills, ISO sets from 100 to 40,000. The menu can increase the range to low 50 and high up to 102,000. I do find these controls a little more complicated to navigate than needed. Press the set key to make the up and down arrows appear, navigate to the setting, then press set again to lock it in, then right to the next one. Now since left and right are used exclusively to go between the options and up and down only to select the setting, why the extra action to enable selection and then to confirm it? The ISO is solid until 6400, even 12.8 remains reasonable. Noise starts to be obvious at 25.6 and increases for H1 and H2, along with some loss of contrast. Once you've determined the highest ISO you want to use, these controls can limit the available settings. The second setting sets the limits for the auto ISO. The minimum shutter speed can also be set manually, or auto, with a range from slower to faster. In aperture priority mode, the standard setting for this scene is ISO 500 at 1 80th. Fastest increases both to capture action, ISO 4000 at 1 over 640. And then slower reduces the shutter and the ISO for a less noisy image, ISO 100 at 1 15th. Canon provides three dynamic range controls, the auto lighting optimizer with four settings, but let's start with a reference image. And then the settings are low, standard, and high. With this mode, the effects are subtle, but there is an increase in contrast. A highlight priority setting with two options to increase range in bright areas, enhanced or D plus two, doesn't seem to have much effect on this image. Now finally, an HDR mode with settings from auto to three stops. It can be enabled for a single shot or until you change the setting. For handheld shooting, an auto align feature is available. And there are five effect versions. This is natural and standard. And then the more extreme, vivid, bold, and the, I don't get it, embossed effect. No raw files are saved for these HDR images. On the Q menu, drive modes can be set from a 10 second timer with up to 10 shots, two or 10 second timers with a single shot. Not sure why we need three positions here. Couldn't one shot just be included on the 10 multi selection? For the high speed burst, I set the RP to record highest quality JPEGs with full manual exposure, focus, and white balance. I turned anti flicker off. While Canon's 5 frame per second burst isn't particularly fast, it is consistent and reliable. I ran it over a minute and the rate didn't pause or falter, capturing exactly 300 frames in 60 seconds. The Canon RP has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to communicate with a smartphone using Canon's free Camera Connect app. Date and time, as well as GPS location information, can be coordinated between the two devices. Images can be set to automatically transfer to the camera. I found this feature to be faster than usual. And reconnection when the camera is powered on is reliable. The app also functions as a remote. And although there's a little lag, touch to select a focus point. There's an on-screen button to focus, another to snap. Now I'm in FV mode, and although the mode can't be changed, the settings, shutter, aperture, and ISO can and video recording is also possible. Back to the camera where video recording starts with the red button, which can be activated in any mode position. The menu provides a limited set of options maxing to 60 frame 1080. 
And then with the dial at the video setting, you have your choice of three options, auto, manual, and HDR mode. Now this is auto, which can record 4K with a substantial crop. I'll show all the crop options in a minute. And this is HDR, which records 1080, and no resolution options are available. In manual video mode, you'll find six screens of options, and although it would be nice to have settings like white balance, ISO, or color profile independent of the still settings, if you change them here, they also change for stills. Manual video mode has the ability to select 4K resolution at 16x9 format, although with a maximum frame rate of 24 frames drop. All settings have a maximum of 30 minutes minus one second. The continuous files are H.264 and save with an MP4 extension in the same folder as the stills. The 4K data rate is about 120 megabits, 1080 about 30. I expected more. At 30 minutes, recording stops with a warning. Okay, when recording video from a still setting, the aspect ratio changes, but there's no left to right crop. In the HD video modes, also no crop. The menu setting Movie Cropping in the menu is disabled in HD modes. Using the Stabilizer crops in, enhanced even more. Disabling the stabilization and switching to 4K introduces a substantial crop. And in 4K mode, the Movie Cropping setting is available, but there's no difference I can see. And as in HD, using the stabilization modes also adds a hefty trim, but provides the excellent stabilization you're seeing in this shot, where the camera is wobbling around at the top of a six-foot monopod held high above my head. The Q menu now has context-sensitive video-specific options, and the M Fun menu can select the ISO and adjust white balance. Now, the Q menu is not available while you're recording, but the M Fun is. In Auto ISO, when light levels change, the exposure changes quickly with a smooth transition, and Canon allows shutter speeds down to 1 8 which provides an interesting blurring effect for video recording. You'll need ND. There are peaking settings for focus, two levels, three colors, and there are no zebras to set exposure. Press Info for the histogram. The manual references an overheat warning, but I wasn't able to provoke it while filling a 64 gigabyte card with back-to-back -back recordings about average battery drain. Now, I was not able to capture a custom white balance by the light of a single flickering candle. This is 2500 Kelvin, and this is the neutral color profile preset. And considering that the ISO is at 25,600, colors are reasonable, there's no odd color shift, and the lens is wide open, f4, bit of noise in the image. Now I'm recording in 4K with the stabilization off, AF servos on with face and eye detection enabled, but although I am in focus, the face and eye detection indicators are not finding me in this low light scene. Now with a forward facing screen, a mic input and headphone output for monitoring and checking playback, the RP is ideal for vlogging, particularly with the stabilization features. Now this is the enabled stabilization in 1080, and I'm holding the camera at the end of a monopod, and these are the onboard mics. Face and eye detector on, and in this crazy crowd celebrating the Raptors NBA championship. Audio levels can be set with auto or manual settings and display on the recording screen. They can also be adjusted using the Q menu where the headphone level can be set. A wind filter and attenuator to lower the recording level for loud sounds can be activated. In HD video mode, a quick side-to-side -side pan shows very little rolling shutter effect. Switching to 4K, the bendy effect is pronounced. Connecting an HDMI recorder or monitor disables the LCD and the viewfinder, so no touch controls are available. In 4K mode, the output is 4K 24 frame. In all other modes, the output is 1080 60 frame. Use the menu to force 4K output to 1080. Press Info to cycle to a clean output. You can also use the menu to force a clean output 
But with this setting, the LCD displays, but the camera can't record internally for either 4K or HD settings. There is an option to set the shutter button to start and stop video recording. The stills cannot be taken while recording video, and I mention this only because the manual does. The in-camera time-lapse provides three get-started-fast presets and a custom setting. The interval can be set from 2 seconds to 60 minutes, 10,000 minus 1 shots. There's a handy reference for the shooting duration and the length of the finished movie. HD or 4K options for the movie, both 30 frame drop. In playback, all of the settings associated with an image can be reviewed. Files can be rotated, cropped, and resized. And the AF point can be displayed along with a highlight alert. Raw files can be converted using an extensive set of options including white balance and the picture styles. And of course, multiple versions of the same image can be saved. There's a comparison so you can see the before and after. Now, if that's an overly technical approach, the Creative Assist mode enables all the same features available while shooting, with the exception of background defocus. The menu system is well designed, clear, and fairly well organized. However, I wish that the setup and custom settings were better integrated, and I'd always like to find similar settings together. Some HDMI options are on the camera menu, others on setup. And I'm puzzled by the decisions behind putting some button options like Video Start Stop on the Setup menu while other buttons are buried deep in custom settings. Now the whole custom settings, which seems like a holdover from some previous menu system, is terribly nested, hard to navigate, and to understand. I would recommend that these be revisited and allocated and integrated back to the camera and setup menus. One flaw in the menu system, there's no way to skip across the highest level tab. The context sensitive nature of the menu, the menus change as you change settings, is both useful and frustrating as it makes it hard to remember where things are, particularly between stills and video, but it does mean the options are always appropriate. And the context sensitivity is very smart. When audio settings are in auto, mic level isn't a cue menu option, but set to manual, and now they're available along with the on-screen meter. But I don't understand why the playback menu is always available. Shouldn't it appear only in playback mode? Dimmed settings, and context sensitive means there aren't many, often have a useful explanation or guidance. And if you do find the menu disorganized or just want fast access to your most used settings, a My menu with up to six tabs can be created. Each can be assigned up to six items from a long list of menu items. So for example, one tab can host all the touch settings. Very flexible, more capable than the competition. Now you may have noticed that there's one word missing from this review. There's been a lot of fuss made about mirrors and optical viewfinders, but in 2019, I'm thinking that's a distinction that no longer matters. I'm not going to make a decision or recommendation about a camera based on those factors. Now, you may have preferences about one or the other. That's one of the many decisions that you can factor into your choice, along with other issues of style or convenience. Now, whether it has a mirror or not, this is a fine camera paired with a great lens that's worthy of your consideration, regardless of your photography requirements. I didn't expect to be quite as impressed at the end of the review as I am. Clearly it has its quirks. I could wish for more video features, but overall, an excellent package. Well, hopefully that covers it and answers your questions, but I welcome your relevant questions and civil comments below. Thanks for watching. And if you like what I do on this channel, please take a second and subscribe.